Hey there, everybody. This is Scott Roark, your host of Considering the Source. So I'm actually sitting at the uh, Washington Dulles Airport right now uh, recording this. And, um, you know, that's just the, that's the way these things happen. And now you can hear, like, the overhead uh, announcement going on. Anyway, um, we're about to go ahead and play for you the most recent episode of Considering the Source. This is an episode that I recorded when I was in Illinois for a week of work. Um, In the time that I was there, I met Steve. And it's not an exaggeration to say that I, I liked him immediately. He, he's a very uh, gentle, very generous, uh, gracious kind of a person. Never has a bad thing to say about somebody. And then I kept hearing people talk about him being a Buddhist, and that intrigued me. And so we were talking from time to time, and um, I asked him, I said, hey, you know, would you be willing for me to go ahead and and do an interview with you? And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to. And so we arranged it. And the cool thing was we went to this um, outdoor park. And um, I'm going to put some pictures of this on the website so you can see um, this this place where we we did this interview. It was just an amazing um, piece of property. And so he and I were basically sitting on this bench in front of this huge um, old house in front of a pond. And this is a live recording and it's all done entirely on on my iPhone. So in the background, you're going to hear these cicadas chirping or singing or whatever it is that cicadas do. But you'll hear that. And um, but but here's the thing I want to tell you about this conversation. Um, it, Steve speaks about Buddhism in a way that um, is really it gives me real clarity if I can say that. Um, now. Steve, he he share he's going to share with you his life, um, starting off you know when he was 11 years old and some struggles he had at 11, um, up till he he was in his 20s and then he talks about um, he talks about his life and and the, some of the pain that he went through in later years. But in spite of all that, um, Steve is still just an incredibly positive person and I consider it a real privilege to call him a friend. So without any further ado, this is my interview with my friend Steve. So, I'm here with Steve, and um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, well, that's, I'm a Buddhist, Okay. as you know, we talked about that. I'm uh, a convert, I was raised a Catholic, became a Buddhist as an adult. Um, I work in IT, uh, sort of through the back door. One of my fav- favorite sayings is I've never had a job I was qualified for. <laughs> um, I follow my interests and I, you know, have enough education and stuff that I've gotten opportunities, but never really followed a very direct path. It's been a rather crooked path that I followed career wise. I started out working as a, uh, painter when I was 11 years old and, uh, working for a guy who painted. And so I was sort of not like upper. artist. Painting. No, like painting the walls, okay. colors, kind of painter. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess I, well, it's sort of art. But. Well, because the the funny story about that, uh, I found out after painting for five or six years that I'm colorblind, <laughs> and I didn't know that. So I I had literally been. That's painting. why I kept. That's why I kept yelling at you. Like, what are you doing? It only happened once in all the years I painted for him. It only happened once because I'm essentially painting by numbers anyhow. I mean, this can is this color written on the top, and you yeah. know. And, I mean, not like people had really close shades of anything, but there was one time where he'd finished a job where we'd done this whole big room in white and done another room in pink, or maybe it was gray and pink, I don't remember, but they were distinctly different colors to all (laughs) y'all. But we went back and and he's like, well, just touch up the switch plates and we can go. We're done. (sighs) So I'm like, great. All right. You know, you just kind of touch up. And so I went back and I touched up. And I put pink polka dots all over the gray switch plates, and I put gray polka dots because the color looks different when it dries as well. And oh so he's my, like, Stever, what are you doing? You know? And he was yelling at me, and we had a good laugh about it later because we had no idea why I did that at the time because I didn't know I was colorblind. So when he told you that, was that your indication like something's wrong? Like you hadn't, you actually had no idea up to that point in time? None, of, none at all. Not at all. It was actually at the uh, my entrance physical for the Air Force Academy when I found out that I was colorblind. You were trying to go into the Air Force? Mm-hmm. To the academy in uh, Colorado Springs. But because of that, you could not? 
Well, I, I still actually got accepted as a non-rated cadet, but I couldn't fly. And that's kind of what I wanted to do, was fly and... Blow things up. No. Well, no. Not so much. Would they have it a lot was, of Buddhist air pilot that's like, I'm well, not, I can't shoot you down. I wish that you would stop I, fighting us. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they would have allowed it, but uh, I, I was not much of a Buddhist at the time. Okay. I was a very different person then. Okay. Um, all right, so... You're a Buddhist, mm -hmm. adult convert to that, mm -hmm. um, raised Catholic, mm -hmm. um, and you're in, do you call it IS or IT? IT. Okay. So, well then let's talk about this, um, being a Buddhist. So, how does one convert, or more, more particularly, how did you convert? What was going on, like, so you're raised Catholic, mm -hmm. and I'm, so were you like a practicing Catholic, or... You're just born into it. I was a practicing Catholic until I was probably 20 years old, I guess. And and was, so when you say practicing, meaning like you're going to mass every week. Oh yeah. Did you consider yourself like a pretty like spiritual guy? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, okay. I was in college, so I don't know if my mom would would qualify that I was <laughs> going to church often enough. Uh -huh. But you know, I was yeah, I was a Catholic. I was living a Catholic life. And okay. Um, but then that changed. I, uh, I got sober when I was 21 and had a rather strong spiritual awakening about how I was living and what well, I was doing with my life. Let's back up a second. Yeah. You're, you're saying, like, I got sober. Yes. And so, like, a lot of people will say that because they'll say, you know, I was an alcoholic. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I started drinking when I was 11. Why did you start drinking when you were 11? Um... I don't know if I have a good answer to that question. Um, because it was there. What was there? Alcohol. Any kind or all kinds? Well, all kinds. All kinds. My parents drank. My parents liked to have parties. And, in fact, I would sort of tend bar at their get-togethers. I would mix drinks for their friends and things while they were, you know, carrying on and playing bridge or listening to music or doing whatever they do. At 11. Uh, actually younger. It was when I actually started mixing myself drinks was when I was 11. But, um, what was uh, your drink of choice? Oh, I don't know that I had. Whatever was available. I mean, yeah. when you're 11. Okay. Well, I figured, like, it's, it's, I'll take a martini. It's, exactly. <laughs> it's not like I could go for shaken and not stirred. <laughs> Did um, your parents know? Um, not really. Um, they knew later when I started drinking a lot. Um which I guess was only a year or two later when I was, when they caught me drinking and things like that. Um, what does that mean, they caught you drinking? Well, they came home and I had a house full of people and the case of beer was empty and... And you're how old at this time? Uh, 12 or 13. And these are other 12 or 13 year olds or you have like college kids in uh, there with you? <laughs> no, these were some other 13 year olds, yeah. They were a little bit older than me, but... Was it just alcohol? Uh, I smoked some pot too. Anything else? Uh, I did some other drugs in college, but that was, was sort of a smattering of trying other things. It was weird because I was, I was a smart kid, and so I knew like, I knew PCP was bad. I knew acid was bad. I mean, I knew bad things would happen, you know. But you know, people around me drank and people around me got high, and nothing bad seemed to happen to them. You mm -hmm. know, there were alcoholics in my family and recovering alcoholics too, but it never really seemed awful. And so, or at least not what I witnessed. Right. And so it was sort of, there was sort of a drinking culture. And, but then other drugs, I really didn't play around with too much, unless I knew nothing about them. Here's, you want to talk about ironic. Yeah. If I knew nothing, if you said, here, try this. And I said, what is it? And he said, I don't know, but it makes you feel really good. I would try it. But so if, if, the, if the report was still out. Yeah, give me that. Right, right. But so if things, I know... Right, like ecstasy was new then, and MDA was, was rather new then, and so it's like, here, it's like, oh, great, it feels good. And I didn't do a lot of it, and I did a little bit of, like, cocaine or that, but I didn't really like that very much, but... What about ecstasy? Um, I liked it, but I had some, I had some bad experiences with it, too, so I... Like what? Uh, well, I nearly overdosed on something one night, uh, that we thought was ecstasy, um, and I was very sick and throwing up blood and my pulse was over 200 and... How did you take it? Um, what do you mean? Orally? It was a yeah. pill. Okay. So I just took it. Okay. And, um, and of course I was, I was in college and my friends 
didn't really know what to do with it. So if they if they had some threshold, like if my pulse got over 250 or something, they were going to take me to the hospital, which is like insane. Yeah. When I think about so they're it. like medical students. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like no, no, plan. seriously, like, dude, 220, <laughs> that's the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and it worked out okay. I mean, I, I survived, obviously. Um, but So you said... You were an alcohol. You are an alcoholic. That's mm-hmm. what your words. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. What? So, and you said you got sober at 21. So, what happens in your 20s that says I was an alcoholic? My life was falling apart. My life as I knew it. You know, I was getting kicked out of school, and I was smart enough not to. And I was irresponsible, and I was sitting around, you know, wondering. I don't know. About halfway into the semester, how I was like about to flunk out again. And but, but how is that not just being an idiot? How how can you definitely attribute it to the alcoholism? Well, um, that that was the spiritual part. Was I was wondering. I mean, there were times I thought I was brain damaged, like I'd just banged my head one too many times, and you know, I just sort of concussed a little hard or something. Because I mean, it was irrational. The way I was behaving was irrational. I was smart enough to be passing tests in engineering at the University of Illinois. Okay. Okay. So that was that took a, a, a bit of smarts to do that. Yeah. You know. Um, yet at the same time, I could not drag myself to class and study enough to do well on those tests or do very well in the tests yeah. or to do very well in the classes. And I could not understand the conundrum. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Because I'm smart enough, but I'm not applying myself and I don't know why. Okay. And then one day, um, and I'd gone through permutations of not drinking and only smoking pot or, you know, just drinking wine or, you know, things like that. And I think I was on one of those cause I was drinking wine. And I was thinking of that with a glass of wine in my hand, uh, halfway to getting smashed again. And it just occurred to me. It was like it was like a rush of both emotion and thought that was just like, oh, my, my God, I'm an alcoholic. And I found peace in that. It was not, there was not shame. There was not wonder. There was not, it was like, oh, that's, that's an answer. Thank you. That's the answer. Do you remember where you were? Mm-hmm. Where were you? I was in my apartment on Locust Street. Were you alone or? My roommate was gone, so I was alone, yeah. Do you remember the date? Uh, Yeah, of course. Yeah, April 10th, 1988. April 10th. So what does April 11th look like? April 11th is when I went to my first AA meeting. How was that? Um, Great. It changed my life. It's where I knew I needed to go. I'd been to an AA meeting before when I was wondering whether I was an alcoholic a couple of years before. And I went to a meeting then and heard people talk about divorces and losing jobs and medical problems and cirrhosis and stuff. I'm like, oh, great. Yeah, it's not me. Thanks. <laughs> you know, none of that's happening to me. Yeah. I'm just having trouble in school. And OK, I guess I just need to try harder. Thanks. OK. And um and so, fast forward a couple of years, I knew when it was happening, and I hadn't drawn a sober breath for weeks. I'd just been down visiting my brother in Atlanta and just drank two weeks away of my life, um, literally, and uh, and was trying to get back into school, and I I'd stayed too long and didn't get back, and I was in trouble in school, and just thought, oh, what, what's what's wrong? And and so I, I went to a meeting that night. I knew that's where I needed to go. And I talked to my mom on the phone that day and told her. Um, she's like, well, you damn well better go to a meeting. She's like, that's what you need to do if you're an alcoholic. I'm like, well, I'm going. So I found a meeting and okay. changed my life. It was, a, it was an overwhelming moment of clarity the night before. Over, and I never took another drink since. Since that day, you've since, never had another drink? Since that drink that night. It's not like I went ahead and finished getting drunk. I put that drink down and I never touched it again. Have you been tempted again? Yes. Yeah, the year my wife died, uh, I was tempted. Unconsciously tempted. It was sort of, it was, that, that was the time that scared me. There's been other times where I wished I could sort of relax a little, you know, and drink yeah. like other people drink and say, wouldn't it be nice to have a beer or two and chill a bit and watch a game and go to bed? Yeah. You know, I've missed that at times, but I... I go for a run instead, or I do other things to, to have that sort of release and that sort of feel good. Um, so I've, I've had those kind of cravings before, but it was the year my wife died that uh, I really unconsciously got close to drinking. I'm standing in front of alcohol to, in the checkout line. I wasn't there for alcohol. 
and I was deciding whether to get the Johnny Walker red or the black because I couldn't remember which I liked. And you were that close. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I, what, what am I thinking? I mean, it just, I like woke up as I was making that decision. And I'm like, I just got to leave. So I just kind of threw my money down on the counter for whatever soda I had in my hand and left and just, but I was actually contemplating which to buy without even deciding to buy it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're 21 and you're sober. How old are you when your wife passes? I was, um, how old was I, 42? So here we are 21 years later. Mm -hmm. And now, okay. So you're 21, you become sober, you go to AA. It starts changing your life. Get a sponsor? Mm Mm-hmm. Guy, girl? Guy. Still in your life? Uh, Yes, remotely, though. Okay. Yeah, he since went back to drinking. Really? Sadly, yes. Badly, too. You can't get back. You've reached out to him, Mm -hmm. and there's just no turning him around? No, he's trying. He's been in and out of rehabs, and, uh, I mean, he was was sober for 15 or 20 years. And we're not sure, because he was drinking and going to meetings for a while. Um, Secretly. Right. And then not so secretly, but... What sent him back? Any yeah. idea? I don't know. So, when does Buddhism enter the picture? Um, Buddhism entered the picture slowly. It was, it was in my early days of recovery that I opened up spiritually to, to God, to say, all right, what is there that's bigger than this? So, in your 20s? Right. Did you find yourself... Um, uh, not questioning, but did you, what, what it was about Catholicism that I guess the best way I can say it is like left questions or left an empty space that Buddhism was able to fill, or is that an accurate way to describe it? Mm, that's probably not an accurate way to describe it because okay. they sort of happened independently. I, I always questioned Catholicism. I was that kid in catechism class who asked the questions that the nuns and, and lay people didn't want to answer. Gotcha. <laughs> I just got in trouble for asking things I wasn't supposed to ask. All right. Um, I had way too many questions about Mary and her virginity. Way too many. <laughs> I had to leave that day. They asked me to go. <laughs> I didn't get it. But okay. I was a little too young and uh-huh. asking inappropriate questions. I didn't know. I just wanted to know. Um, but fortunately, we had we had awesome lay ministry and, and youth ministry in the church I grew up in. And so they were really, really good to me. And that's how I was able to stay in the church as long as I was. Because they were just really cool about being being where I'm at, you know, and I didn't, I didn't realize that the changes that came about in Catholicism during the years that I was in it, because they were sort of growing too. Um, and the, the youth ministers really helped me understand that. But anyhow, um, so I'd kind of always questioned it. I've always kind of wondered like, well, wait a minute, you know, if it's just us and only us, what happens if you're born in the mountains of China and there's no Catholicism? You, you really just go to hell. Well, no, <laughs> Was the and I'm like, well, explain that. You know, I, I I'd like to know because okay. that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. It, and so I had those kind of questions, big questions. Okay. Um, and you did not the whatever answer they gave you, you're like, mm, no. Right. I could sort of see the holes in it. Okay. Not that it was bad. And I, 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 you know, I guess I probably in my teenage years had times I was rebelling against it. But as an adult, when I was reevaluating it, it just sort of seemed like there were holes. And so I was looking for a. a a bigger container spiritually. Okay. Um, and so I looked at a Native American. I looked at um, Eastern religions. I looked at you know Hinduism. I sort of explored these other things and and found um, Taoism, which is where I just started reading the Tao Te Ching, um, which was sort of popular um, back in the early '90s, and it just sort of grabbed me. And I just thought, well, this is kind of cool. And Taoism is a, is a sort of a, a predecessor to Buddhism. Okay. And um, and so I would I would read a chapter from the Tao and meditate for a bit that day. And I was trying out different forms of meditation at the time, guided imagery and relaxation and all that kind of stuff. Because meditation and prayer is a key part of recovery, of, of growing spiritually. And um, which is as important as stopping drinking um, in recovery circles. But, um, so I was exploring alternatives and, and that was one that sort of landed with me. And I, I, I glommed onto it sort of individually then I didn't really pursue it 
as uh, any sort of group effort. I read things and would talk to people about it who had read it and kind of have some cool coffee table conversations, but um, never really got serious about it. And then it was in the uh, the year or two after my wife died um, that I started looking at it more seriously and found a teacher um, in Kankakee, a uh, girl I was dating at the time, um, was, uh, was interested in the group, and so I found it. And... Um, and it was like home. It was like, great. I, I now have a, a deeper um, venue, a, a stronger venue to sort of study this and be supported and and be taught as well as just sort of explore it on my own. And that's when I really took off and started studying more and reading more and okay. meditating more. And... Um, I'd like you to explain to a listener who really doesn't know much about Buddhism Try to give a, uh, a layman's explanation of what it is. What are some of the key components, maybe the key beliefs, things like that. Okay. Um, uh, probably one of the first things to understand about Buddhism and answering a question like that is mm-hmm. there are almost as many flavors of Buddhism as there are of Christianity. I mean, there are people that okay. have different... It's splintered in similar ways that there are people that have adopted this is the part that really mattered or this is the thing that the Buddha said that mattered more than that or whatever. So there are differences and so the, you can get a different answer for that depending on which Buddhist okay. you ask. Um, so this is really just my own interpretation of that. But one of the, the fundamentals of Buddhism is, is that there's there's suffering. It's called the Four, four Noble Truths. It's, it's accepting that there is suffering in the world. Um, and that there is a way out of suffering and that there is a path to follow to get out of suffering um, and that following that path or this this path will lead you out of that suffering. That's sort of the fundamentals of it. It's just sort of... There is suffering. Mm-hmm. There is a path out of suffering. There is an end to suffering. There is an end to suffering. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. There's, there is a path out of suffering. Okay. And following the path out of suffering will take you out. Okay. We'll end it. All right. And it's sort of from there. There's a that's where a lot of the variances come. And and the the group I follow or, or work with is is naturalist Buddhism or natural Buddhism, uh, born out of Chan Buddhism. And really, it's it's mindfulness. It's focusing on your your mind and your thoughts, and learning how to understand what my mind does in this world that makes me suffer. And what I could do to stop my mind from doing those things that make me suffer. Okay. And meditation for me um, is a key practice for that. What does meditation look like? Uh, if you're watching, it looks like I'm doing nothing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for me, I, I, I just sit. And um, I used to sit on a cushion more, but it hurt my back. And so I just sit in a chair now. And um, There's an end to suffering. There's an end to suffering. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, and I focus on my breath. And so while I sit, I, I focus on my breath in and out and I ask my mind, uh, or pay attention to my mind to get back to that whenever it wanders away from it. During that time, Mm -hmm. how long does this normally last? It depends. I meditate about a half hour a day. Um, and then when I meet with our group, it's a 90 minute sit that we sit together. Um, and, and meditate together. I've been on retreats where we've meditated for four or five days. Um, Straight? Mm-hmm. Well, you stop to eat and sleep, but... What, is there, are there any heavy breathers Then you, now you're, all you're doing is focusing on their breath? Um, of course. You, it's, it's easy to get distracted. Uh, it's the snorers you got to watch out for. Uh, present company <laughs> because included. You, because uh, do you ever fall asleep during it? Oh, yeah. In fact, I've, I've come to accept that I, I start to fall asleep almost every time I sit. It's, and I, I've come to accept it now. Rather than reject it as, oh, my gosh, I shouldn't do this. It's like, oh, this is my mind wanting to sleep. This is me wanting to avoid. Okay, what's that look like? Let's get back to your breath. And then it passes. Do you set an alarm? Yeah, I have a, I've got an app for that. Uh, I've got an app that I use that rings a bell at the beginning and, and dings a chime at the end and so on so I can uh, make sure I, you know, I, I sit in the morning so I don't want to be late for work because I've sat. And you can get into deep states of, of concentration. I'm not very good at it. Other people are. There's other people that are much better at sitting than I am. What does that look like for them? The ones that are um, really good, your professional sitters. What the are... professional sitters, it's they hit that sort of deep 
concentration, place of timelessness, where they're just, it's kind of pure bliss because there's not anything to tell you that anything's wrong. You've gotten to the place where you've, your mind isn't paying attention to things that would tell you things are other than, or should be other than they are. And it's a very peaceful place to be. But how do you Mm -hmm. know what they're experiencing? Uh, Only from what they've told me. Okay. I don't know. Um, I've come close, but only, only glimpses. Uh, I you can, started snoring and then it brought you right back yeah, out? Exactly. And here I thought we were there. And <laughs> wake up an hour later in a puddle of drool and it just wasn't the same. Um, <laughs> no, it's, I've talked with them about it because I'm, I'm interested to know. And, um, and the people who are, who are able to reach those states talk about it a lot, about the bliss that comes from that. And it's not, it's not euphoric. It's, it's, it's sort of on the neutral end of euphoric. It's just sort of like... It's all good. And what, what is the benefit of the meditation? How do you see it benefit you in your life afterwards? Um, I see the direct benefit because for me, it's like uh, I'm training my mind. It's like practice, uh, okay. like working out. You know, I, I run so that I can run better on a day that I need to run better, whether that's a race or a marathon or whatever I'm training for. And so I, you know, I, I run and I exercise so that I'm better able to do something later. And meditation for me is exactly that, where I take time with my thoughts and my mind during a very sterile circumstance yeah, where there aren't a lot of other things to pay attention to. And if I'm having trouble (laughs) in a very quiet, peaceful place, keeping my thoughts focused, how hard would it be in a busy place, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's like the practice field. So I spend time with my mind. Um, one of the analogies I use for myself is like training a puppy on a leash. That if, it, if my mind wanders off, I kind of tug on the leash and say, let's go back to your breath. And then I come back to my breath. And don't judge where I left or why I left or make that thought more important. Whatever work problem I'm solving or grocery list I'm compiling or conversation I'm having in my head with someone, it'll still be there when I'm done. And I don't need to to call that an insight now. The only insight I really need is to get my thoughts back to my breath. Let me ask you an honest Mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Do you understand how, like to a person who doesn't practice this, like it's like, it's alien. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, well, because I've been there. I mean, it was alien to me. I mean, I, I laughed in my teacher's face when he was talking about some of this. Like, well, what do you mean? And he told me some circumstances under which he was able to maintain mindfulness, you know, during strife and difficulty in his life and with his family and, and you know, a lot of, you know, hypothesized situations, how he would react. And, and it was incredibly flat because he knows how to control his thoughts. He knows how to say, well, I, I would pay attention to what was happening at the time instead of being wrapped up in future loss or reliving previous hurts or things like that. Um, and, and it's so, yeah, I've, I've looked at my teacher exactly like you were looking at me a second ago, like you're, (laughs) you're out of your mind. No, Um, no, no, that's not it. I, 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 I'm, I can, I can acknowledge that, um, you are experiencing something that I have never experienced and therefore you can talk Let's describe it like a color. Mm-hmm. You're describing a color that you've seen. And I'm like, what are you talking about, this color? Mm-hmm. It's not that I think you're crazy. I think you've experienced something that I never have. Well, I would, I would agree with that because I never experienced until I had either. I was not aware of how cluttered my thoughts were until I started to clean them up. And it's helped me enormously because, for example, if I can do that and I can train myself in a very controlled situation at home where it's quiet and no one's around and there aren't a lot of other noises, then I can be at work and a problem can be happening. A a server's down and I need to assess. Are we bringing in people? Who do we need to notify? What's the impact? How long? Are we going to a backup site? There's a lot of things to look at. Who do we alert? Um, All those kinds of things. And and if I'm distracted by what's not important, I'm not going to be very effective at what's important. Mm -hmm. And so I need to be, be able to very quickly assess what's important, do the right thing, and move on to the next right thing. And if I'm busy worried about, well, what's the president going to say because the mail server's down? It's not going to help me get the mail server up. At yeah. all. It's not useful. There's no point during fixing that server that being scared to death of my president is going to help me fix it faster. Okay. You know, 
Um, and so being able to, and now I, I have other people who do that. So now I can say, you go take care of this. I'll talk to this person to notify them of the problem. And I can assess a situation from a different perspective. Okay. And then, you know, if I need to have moments later where I address why it was down as long as it was or what the impact was or why we made the decisions we did, I can also handle that at the time it's time to handle that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the way it sort of helps me in my everyday life. I don't really get so so distracted or more importantly, that's rather self-righteous. I recognize when I get so distracted. I recognize, oh, I veered off. This is not happening right now. I need to focus on what's happening right now. And so when I'm not telling the story about what's happening and just experience what's happening, I'm more peaceful and I'm more effective and more helpful. Let me ask you this big question. Do people like you better as a Buddhist? If they'd met you a long time ago before you're Buddhist, like he was an ass. But, but Buddhist Steve is pretty awesome. I think that's a question for others, not for me. Um, I you, don't, must have an, you must have a leaning though. You know the honest answer? I, 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 I know I have less of a leaning because it doesn't bother me. I don't live... If you would have asked me that 20 years ago, I would have been very concerned about what other people thought of me. Very concerned. And I'm not concerned about what other people think of me because I have no control over it. And the little control that I would think I have is not useful. It, it would be manipulation. And so I'm way more comfortable with the idea that, the, as we were talking about before, that there are people who think I am a raving jerk, that think that I am, I am a lunatic, that I am whatever, distant or, maybe, or whatever. There's people think all kinds of things. And, I, and some of them are right and some of them aren't. And I have no control over that. And it doesn't bother me anymore as much. It doesn't bother me as okay. much. Okay. Right. I, can, I can see it when it bothers me. Okay. So, who is Buddha? Um, Buddha's a man who reached enlightenment um, and shared the teachings of what he learned from becoming enlightened. These very teachings that our attachments to what's happening around us don't help us be happy. In fact, it's releasing those attachments that that make us be more peaceful. And so he was a man that lived 2,500 years ago, plus or minus, um, who had these teachings and, had, and learned these things. And there are some that say that there have been Buddhas before and since, that he was a Buddha among many. Um, and most, most Buddhists I hang with don't worship the Buddha in that way. We appreciate what we've been taught. Okay. And it doesn't, the, the, the man isn't as important. Because if I were to stop what I was doing and go, oh, it's the Buddha, it's the Buddha, look, 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 here he is. Yeah. I, would have, I would have gained, a, I would have applied a sense of attachment to a man who's just a man instead of encountering him as a man and maybe saying, hey, you look hungry, would you like something to eat? Or, which might have been more useful to him at the time. Or whatever. Was he instead hungry of, often? Um, well, they begged. He yeah, actually, he, he, he lived a monastic life. He left a, a life of riches to live a, a monastic life, to experience suffering. Um, and to confront things like... He intentionally wanted to live and experience suffering? Yes. Yes. Because? Well, once he left the palace, the story is, once he left the palace, uh, where everything was wonderful, the land of milk and honey, so to speak, and saw sickness and aging and poverty, and I would and ventured out on his own, because every time he'd been out before, where it was all gala. And when he ventured out on his own, he saw the streets. Okay. And the streets were not a pretty place. And so he thought, I need to leave the fantasy world that I've been living in, and I need to live in the world, because... This is reality. This, exactly. Let's say that it could be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Buddha did not exist. Mm -hmm. And that this is all man-made. Mm -hmm. I have a suspicion that your answer is, I don't care. My life continues exactly as it has. And this <clears throat> You're exactly right. Um, the, the man, the Buddha, is not as important to me as the teachings I've been given and the experience, my first-hand experience, yeah. with how that works. There's no mystery. That's one of the things that, that makes Buddhism technically more of a philosophy and less of a religion, is that there's no mystery. 
go experience it. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, go sit on a cushion and see what happens to your mind. And then go do that in the world. And then see if, if the levels of what you experience match what we say or others say would be that experience. And if you, if you look at it honestly, you know, most people will have the same experience. And so that to me is, is, I don't know, an ultimate truth. Okay. It's just, it's firsthand. I don't have to, I don't have to believe in him as a person or where he lived or how he lived to be able to say, hmm, when I'm not attached to, I need this car, I really, really need this car. Or whatever, I need this job. Oh, I got, you know, when I don't have those attachments, I'm happier. And when I have those attachments, I might be satiated when I get them, but I'm also equally disappointed when I don't, or when they're threatened, even worse. When right. I have them and they're threatened, oh man, talk about stress. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Ask, ask a parent of a young child how they're going to put their kids through school, oh man their stress because they've already decided they have to go to school it has to be a good school I have to pay for it there's all this stress when you let go and say well I, I don't know how that's going to go and I'll do my best to help my child because I can because I will yeah well there's no stress in that and if I don't get in a position where I can pay for my child to go to school then that's where I'll be it does that make sense yes okay. it does um, in Christianity, like uh, the, the thing I think about is um, where Jesus basically is teaching, um, um, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Um, and he says things along the lines of, uh, just, I, I think it's like, look at the flowers of the field. Mm -hmm. They have everything they need. If your heavenly father loves the flowers, how much do you think he loves you? And would he not provide equally for you? Mm -hmm. So that w what you're saying reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. When you say that the Buddha reached enlightenment, what does that mean? Enlightenment. Um, very good question. It means it means different things to different people. My understanding of, of enlightenment or nirvana is when um, a person has has reached a state of mindfulness where they're aware of their attachments and have been able to separate from their attachments. All, all attachments. All of them. That. It's, it's a state where I've stopped, or someone, I've never been anything like that, but where someone has stopped attributing stories to everything they see and they take it exactly as face value and that they can love the person sitting next to them the same as they love their own child. Exactly the same as they love their own child. It's equal. Um, that kind of equanimity um, comes from an enlightened state where where we're not busy wondering what we should do. The right thing to do is always obvious. It's the dirt between me and the right thing to do that makes it really hard to choose. In, in every situation. When I act intuitively, when I act, intuitively is not even the best word. That's why it's enlightenment. When I act without attachment, I know the right thing to do. Always. If someone's suffering, if, 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 if someone falls in the lake here, I'm gonna go help them. I'm not gonna stop and wonder is that a black person or a white person? Do I know them? Are they are they okay? You know. Oh, what wait, am I wearing? Let, let, me, let me set my phone down. No, kid falls in. I'm I'm in. I'm in. And the, and all that stuff is the dirt you're talking about. Exactly. You know. Oh, I'm gonna be late. I gotta be somewhere. Someone else will help them. No. I mean, in in a genuine situ crisis situation, most of us, when we're clean, when we're unencumbered or unattached, we know exactly the right thing to do. And that's an obvious situation. But those obvious, those not so obvious situations confront us throughout the rest of our day, and they're a lot harder to see. Sure, they're a lot harder to see. Getting getting the checkout line behind someone who's got twelve items in the ten item express lane, and and see if you begin to count. Right. Yes, I count, and I I count out loud. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's thirteen, right. sir. Thirteen. <laughs> Just saying. Do you need help bagging your thirteen items, sir? <laughs> I don't have anywhere to go. So, the last question I'll ask you, because it's the one that's come to my mind, is like, so, what happens when you die? I die. That's it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Buddha is, is there any kind of afterlife in Buddhism? Um, is it like Hinduism, where there's like, you, you keep trying? 
until you reach enlightenment the, or the, the Tibetans are big fans of reincarnation they, they believe more in as far as I understand at least believe more in reincarnation closer to Hinduism um, I kind of look at it as and the, and the group I study with looks at it as it doesn't matter I'm being reborn right now so are you it's all being reborn up until the it's, moment you die right in which moment do I die do I die when my heart stops beating? You could bring me back. Do I die when I'm in a vegetative state and you decide it's time to pull the plug? Do I die in an instant because it's a crash? How do you know? Do I die a week later when you get the email that, oh, that guy you knew, yeah, he's gone now. Well, that's when I died for you because when I actually died, you didn't know and it didn't matter. And so when we look at life and, and death and, and all the, the, the constant birth and rebirth that's happening around us and, and, and death um, it's constant and so belief in an afterlife is moot because doing the right thing I mean if is its own reward if the kid falls in the lake you jump in I'm not jumping in so that I get a spot ahead of you in line sure I'm going in because that's what needs to be done and so it doesn't change anything Whatever happens next, happens next. Um, one, of the, one of the concepts or precepts of, of Buddhism is of impermanence, that things are not permanent. And the whole idea that there is a something that lasts forever doesn't really stand up, logically. And it's debatable, and, and it's certainly a larger scope than we're talking, than this conversation would be. But in the sense of life and death, it, and the idea of a soul, it doesn't matter as much because if, if what I'm trying to do is gain points for my soul for any type of advancement later, I'm not in the moment at all. I'm lost. Yeah. And so I've already died. Yeah. And when I don't care and I'm not aware and it, in fact, oblivious to what will happen to me in the next moment, much less the next life, I am at, pu I'm at peace, pure peace. And then it won't matter what happens next because whatever happens next will be more like that piece. You're the craziest person I've ever met. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> when I'm talking to people who aren't Christian, it annoys me because they'll say something like, um, well, this, this thing that happened isn't very Christ-like. And they'll equate th certain things like that Christians will do and saying that's not, and they're very angry and they lump it in with Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, let's think about the, that church and that dude and his whole group that will protest all these funerals oh, yeah. and say that God hates the fags. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so my question to them every time is, in your understanding of Jesus, is that how he would act? And their immediate answer is no. And so my question is then, are they really acting like Christians? Mm -hmm. And the answer is absolutely no, they're not. Now, the problem with that is, is that now, just like there's multiple versions of Buddhism, now people are like, well, my Jesus, <laughs> my Jesus would love homosexuals. My Jesus would crucify them. My Jesus loves black people. My Jesus hates black people. So, like, they all have their own little Jesus. And that's the thing in, in Christianity that, like, I... I wish you guys wouldn't do that. Because my Jesus isn't like that. <laughs> right. <And> I, <laughs> right. Well, and, I mean... It's funny because it goes back to, you asked me about my license plate earlier. Okay? Yes. And this is exactly what Wu Wei means. Wu Wei. Wu Wei. It means non-doing. So Jesus never acted. That's the point. There wasn't anything Jesus did that was Christ-like, except for everything. Yes, yes. And he so just he, was. He just did it. Yeah. He just did it. And so he didn't say, well, let's see. You know, I fed the poor, we did the whole fish and bread thing, <gasps> raised the dead. Okay, I got things to do today. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. He went looking for Lazarus. Mm -hmm. He found him. Mm -hmm. He did what he did. And it meant what it meant. And that doesn't, that doesn't change anything. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? It was just action. Yeah. 
just like it wasn't premeditated. Before. It wasn't premeditated. He in, did in, not in a sense have that a like PR I, specialist. Yeah. There wasn't anyone watching. He didn't say, well, bring bring Lazarus to town. You yeah. know, I'm going to oh, show, show you something. <laughs> bring him to Nazareth. <laughs> it's going to solve a problem for me later on. <laughs> right. Okay. He just did what he did. So do you believe that Jesus existed? Yes. Do you believe Jesus was raised from the dead? I don't know. No, I don't know. You don't know or no? I don't know. What if, what if he did? Okay. Like, do you think there's anything to that? No. No, what I mean is, if, if it could be proven, like, yeah, he literally was dead mm -hmm. for like three days, mm -hmm. and then he came back, mm -hmm. would you think there's anything to that? If, like, legitimately he was dead, it wasn't mm -hmm. like he was sleeping, like, the, the ability for a human to be dead mm -hmm. and to come back to life, to have, basically, mm -hmm. as Christian would say, power over death, mm -hmm. would that seem significant to you? Not in the way you're asking it. In what way, then? Because the power over death is sitting between us right now. And if we can't learn that, why do we have to decay for three days to learn it? Oh, here, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. What, what, I don't, what do you mean sitting between us? There's nothing it's between right us. Here. It's, it's, it's what's happening around us all the time. Right, but you will die so, yes. at a certain point in time. Yes. And you will not come back. Why not? Well, I asked you earlier and you said, nothing, I die. Right. You said I won't come back. Why are you saying I won't come back? I, because you didn't say you were going to come back. I don't know, is what I told you. Oh. I don't, I don't know. think you did. I don't think I don't you know. said, I don't know. I think you said, when I die, I, I die. I die, right. Well, and Jesus died. Right. And he died. So and you, you do think happened. you will come back? I don't know. I know that I don't know. Oh, okay. I know that I don't know. Got it. And if, and if Jesus came back, I would look to see what the lesson was in there. Why would he come back? What am I supposed to learn from that? If I'm supposed to learn from Jesus coming back, then I'm supposed to be good to people. No, I've ne that is not a lesson that I've ever learned from that. Okay. That was Catholicism. That's Catholicism. If I'm learning that there's a day of reckoning, or that there's, that there's more to life than living, that there's more to what's happening now than what we think, and it matters in a sense of forever, great. I don't think, I think that's one of many lessons that can help me live better today. I'm going to have to listen to this podcast like myself. I might have to too. Because like the stuff you're saying, like I, I have it's, to actually rewind it and, well, and and think about it. Get a thesaurus out. Not a thesaurus, but, <laughs> but thesaurus. Is, it's like a dinosaur. Right. It's a plural of thesaurus. Yeah. You need more than one. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's... It, and, and, that's, and that's the part that I take that makes me wonder whether or not I'm Christian, is that if I have to apply significance to that, that's prescribed, then I'm going to ask why. And then in a lot of Christian circles, if I ask why, then I don't have faith in a mother work for me. And then I, then I despise that circle. Well, I, I, just, I, don't desp I just don't agree with it. I don't see how that helps anyone. I'm going to say despise. Okay. okay. Because it is, it, is, um, it is more destructive. Yeah. Jesus yeah. himself was surrounded by people who... Listen, I don't know of anybody who has mm -hmm. the uh, absolute perfect faith. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to have doubts, mm -hmm. is the way I would think. And so, to, if a person is just asking a question to be a jerk, or to... Um, if there's not a genuine sincerity behind the question they're asking, mm -hmm. I would have a problem with that. Right. But, but for you to reject somebody or to be offended because of a, a sincere seeking question, mm -hmm. um, if, if, that, if your faith can't handle those kind of questions, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sadly, there's a lot of people who can't. There's a lot of people that are drawn to aspects of religion to be prescribed answers instead of to answer questions. Yeah. And, and to, to live with the questioning. Um, and that's what they seek, and that's what they find, and that they find comfort in that. But I, right. I don't. I, I find comfort in, um, in experiencing the answer. And, and that's sort of what, that's why when you asked earlier about whether I left Catholicism or converted, mm -hmm. it wasn't like that. It was no longer useful. 
it wasn't serving me to question Catholicism anymore. Mm -hmm. I got it. Mm -hmm. I got it about being good to people and feeling bad about what I've done, or more importantly, learning from what I've done so I don't do that kind of bad again. Yeah. And even as I intend good, I might think I'm helping someone and then realize, oh, that didn't really help. I, I'm going to do it differently next time. Okay. You know, um, those kind of lessons, I got it. I got it. And and I needed, to, I needed more. I needed to move forward and I needed to rely more on life's experience, the now experience, and not gambling on whether the day I die I'm in a credit or a debit with, with the man upstairs. Right. That's There's only that. And if I'm not in... The, I, the same is true right now. Heaven and hell is right before us. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Whatever you want to call heaven or hell, it's sitting here on this bench. And we're either suffering because of what we believe and do, mm -hmm. or we're feeling peace because of what we believe and do. And that is a choice oh, no, I like that lives that. within us all the time. And so when the day comes when I stop breathing or my heart stops beating, mm -hmm. I hope that my thoughts and actions will be at peace so that whatever happens next will be propelled by peace. Yeah. And that's why when I say when I die, I'll die. And when Jesus died, he died. And if, if Jesus' crucifixion is half true, he found peace under the most horrible circumstances imaginable imaginable mm -hmm. okay and if he can do that there I can do it when my job is tough I can do it when my family is sick or I can do it when there's a car wreck that happens that wasn't happening on the schedule that I had because there's going to be car wrecks and people are going to get hurt and stuff's going to happen and it's going to be horrible it's going to hurt people are going to experience loss but I don't need to feel like I can control that. I want to be at peace when that happens to me. And the only way I can do that is to be at peace right now. Okay. So you're mentioning loss. Mm -hmm. How long ago did your wife pass? It's been seven years. What happened? She killed herself. She'd struggled with depression most of the time that I knew her, in fact, all the time that I knew her. Um, and I didn't know uh, that she was also struggling later with bipolar disorder. And her thoughts of suicidality, um, as she got older and tireder and depression medication wasn't working as well, kind of swung with greater intensity. And then there was a year where it just all came unraveled. Worst year of my life. Unimaginable. It was the worst year of my life. What happened that year? Um, well, as, as she was sort of spiraling out of control, um, our marriage was suffering as a result. It began to crumble. And it was getting harder and harder for me to hold on and for her to hold on to me. And the responsibilities of family life were crushing her. And... Uh, and then it was, I will never forget, it was uh, on the way home from my cousin's funeral in Chicago. Uh, I'd, unbeknownst to me, she had attempted suicide that day. And so my daughter and I came home and found her nearly dead in our house. Um, and uh, went through the whole 911 and got her to the hospital. And she recovered at that time, but I don't know that she ever fully recovered. And um, How old was your daughter at this time? She was 10 then and 11 when she died. And um, and so it was a miserable year in between. She was trying to recover and never really ever got her footing again. And nothing was stable in her life anymore. And she was, it was awful to watch someone come unraveled like that. And to love them so much and want to do so much and to be completely ineffective, in fact, damaging. There were just things that I thought were helpful and they were not helpful. And um, and there really wasn't anything I could do. What day was that when she died? Um, it's an interesting question. She, um, she took an overdose on April um, 4th. I went in the hospital. And um, they never got her back. She didn't die right away. 
But she was in the hospital for four days and died that Monday on April 8th. And so it's, she died on the 8th, but she kind of died on the 4th. That's why when you asked me earlier right. about when someone died, I'm not, she, in some ways she died the year before. Mm -hmm. Most of what I knew that was Edith died the year before. Did you find her? Um, the first time I found her, the second time she, um, she was trying to call me and was trying to call 911 as well. And the police found her. Um, she started having second thoughts about it? Um, sort of. That's, she'd have to answer that. My experience, the first time I, I found her and took her to the hospital and she came to, she was genuinely disappointed. I was surprised to see that. She was genuinely disappointed to have survived. And that caught me off guard. Um, and I had a lot of denial about it. wasn't even sure what I saw. And then the same time when I met the um, paramedics and stuff at the hospital when she came, when they brought her there when she was succeeding, um, she was equally disappointed. She was pissed. Um, and then, as it turns out, she was becoming agitated and stuff because of what the the medications and stuff she took to overdose on was doing to her. So it was kind of, she was really unraveling before my eyes. So it was really hard to gauge what her intentions were. You said that you could tell that she was disappointed. What did that look like? It looked like disappointment. We'd been together almost 20 years, and you know someone. You don't have to speak to, sometimes. You know how it is. Mm -hmm. Look across the table. You know when you're in trouble. You know mm -hmm. when things are okay. You know, you know when it's time to go. You know when it's time to stay. You know all kinds of things from a look. And she just looked disappointed. Her, her face and her eyes just said, oh, no. Because she cried. She was sad to be alive. Did the, did the depression have a epicenter, for lack of a better term? Did it have a, was there a source to it, that her depression, or was it more really like a chemical? That's a really hard question to answer. Um, she'd always had it for the whole time I'd known her. And so it was chronic. And um, I don't think she would ever say, I was fine until this happened and then I got depressed. Yeah. I just think as she struggled with alcoholism and she struggled with life and she struggled with getting on her feet, part of what she understood with the help of medical professionals was that she was paddling upstream in a way that others weren't, and that was depression. And I think that's sort of what it was to her. Now, there were lots of things that, she, that weighed heavy on her soul in her life, okay. as there is for most people. Yeah. Um, some people have that and are depressed and some people have that and aren't depressed. So I can't say what the cause was Yeah. and neither could she. We had, I'm, I'm very grateful for the year that we had in between because I, we had a lot of very meaningful conversations during that year of understanding her and what happened and in her life, just how things went. We had a lot of very meaningful conversations. So I'm grateful for that. Was she Buddhist? No. No. She was Unitarian, which was sort of um, what got me more into Buddhism was we, when I realized, when, when our daughter was born, we went religion shopping because we realized that she was raised a Unitarian. Um, and, uh, and we went shopping. We just thought, all right, we want to raise our child in something. Mm -hmm. we, we each had something growing up, uh, you know, with its, both its assets and its liabilities and, and shortcomings, that it was useful yeah. to have something. And we wanted our daughter to have something. And uh, we looked at Judaism, we looked at Catholicism, we looked at Presbyterian, we looked at Methodist, we looked at a variety of things. And we came around to Unitarianism. That was sort of the, because it sort of exposed her to, to everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out to be very useful for that. But um, So Edith was a Unitarian. She explored all aspects of spirituality. 
you know, where I sort of was getting focused, she was getting broader. She just sort of saw mm. all aspects. She saw the merit in all religions and ways. Did that difference ever cause problems? No. Okay. No, we were very accepting spiritually of each other. And your daughter, where did she end up spiritually? Um, well, she hasn't ended up. So she's, okay. where is she she's still in process. Where's her journey today? Um, I, I'm not sure how she would answer that. She doesn't call herself a Christian. She calls herself a Unitarian. And um, I think that she would say that she, like her mother, sees the merit in many faiths um, and has yet to embrace one. How did her mom's death affect her? Um... Another hard one to answer. Immediately, there was a bit of relief because that year before was, was hectic and horrible and unstable and scary and challenging. We never knew what we were going to find. I mean, I used to, as an adult, I used to call them suicide drills. I would see a set of circumstances. She'd stop answering messages or I wouldn't, she wouldn't answer her phone. I wouldn't hear from her for a while. And, and I'd start to worry, and I'd piece together, I'd find something meaningful in the trash, and I'd think, oh no, and then I'd go find her, and she was asleep, and bothered that I woke her up. And and then I'd later find out that, yes, yeah, she was on the verge earlier that day, but by the time I went, yeah, it was great. You're kidding. It was, yes, it was incredibly unstable. It was just uncertain. I didn't know what to trust in my own instinct, and I was an adult, an educated adult. And my daughter was 11. And so she didn't know. She she didn't know which mom was going to pick her up today. Was it going to be the mom who was mad at the teachers because of, something didn't go right? Was it going to be the man, mom who was going to have to fight not to cry in the car? She picked her up in the car line. Would it be mom who was just kind of flat? Or would it be energetic, enthusiastic mom who wanted to go do stuff? It was really, really hard for her. So I think initially um, my daughter felt relief because she just didn't have to carry that anymore. I didn't understand it because I thought it was hidden grief. Um, and it may be, but it's not mine to understand. It's hers. Uh, we talk about it a lot, but um, now it's starting to surface more as grief. She's realized, um, as she's getting more help professionally, that she has some PTSD around that and that she doesn't remember much before that at all. Really? Yeah. I just recently learned this a year ago. Um, and, and it helps explain a lot because she just walled that off sure. it was too hard and so we've I've been helping her like just when she was last in we would look at some videos when she was young with her and her mom and things like that and sort of work on all the other aspects of her mom instead of just the instead of just the end there was yeah. a there was there was a whole book to Edith's life not just the last chapter sure and it was a good book it's a remarkable woman she's a remarkable woman and her daughter's turning out a lot like her. She's pretty remarkable. So it's, I'm glad to, to see her open up to those connections because there's ways that she's not like me. You know, mm -hmm. she needs to experience her mom. And Has she asked you questions about Buddhism? Yes, she teases me about it. Because, well... Because her friends, I think, tease her about it. Um, that, that her dad's a Buddhist? Well, that I'm a hippie. <laughs> okay, so they're all like, your dad smokes pot, right? And she's like, no, he used to, but he doesn't anymore. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, he has to. And, you know, he's all Buddhist. And you know, we've got Buddhas around the house or, you know, decorations or things like that. You do have those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, and so her friends just, just ask her about it a lot. And... and so I, I don't know that she's embarrassed by it. I think she just thinks it's something sort of silly. And and I don't know. I, don't know. She, I should ask her to yeah. see what her impression is of it. I think she's okay with it because she knows that she knows where I am in my life. And I'm pretty firmly grounded. Even, I mean, it's still chaos in my life right now. But she sees that I keep my footing. That I regain my footing even when it's lost. And whatever the reason, she's grateful for that because... My footing is her footing. Okay. Yeah, less so as she gets older. Yeah. But. Somebody asked me um, a week or so ago, 
They said, if you weren't a Christian, mm-hmm. what would you be? And and I said it like, I, I, I said, um, I think that Buddhists are pretty cool. And I, and not because I've known a Buddhist that I, I I've, you're the first actual Buddhist uh-huh. that, I mean, I may have met people that are Buddhist, but I just didn't know that they are. You're the first one that I've actually known. Mm-hmm. And um, like when I, in the time I've known you, I'm like, man, I would love to work for that guy because like, uh, you're like, they, if, I don't know about what the whole Zen thing is, but you are so even keeled and, um, positive And like, I just like hanging out with you. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you. So I don't know if I should write a letter to your denomination or something, but, <laughs> but you're, 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 you're an awesome Buddhist. If I have to talk to the Dalai Lama, is he, that's Buddhism, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if I get to see him, I will put in a good word for you well, because you. you're, he should be proud of he's you. He's looking for me. He's, he's wondering. Yeah. So there you have it. That's my interview with my friend, Steve, and I really do consider him a friend. Um, I just want to say thank you to him for being so painfully open. Um, The only questions he wouldn't answer were questions that he couldn't answer because it wasn't his perspective. But he just spoke so clearly and so openly. Um, I I greatly appreciate it. It was an absolute pleasure to to do that with him. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please uh, be sure and tell your friends or family about Considering the Source. Feel free to check us out on Facebook or our website, www.consideringthesource.com. You can download episodes from that site or you can download them from iTunes. If you are going to go to iTunes, please be sure to uh, subscribe so that with every new episode as it comes out, it'll automatically be downloaded to whatever source you're using. So thank you guys so much for listening. And remember, everybody, everybody has a story.